Chapter 27a, The Male Reproductive System. First, let me start with a small warning. Today's lecture may not be suitable for all audiences because it does contain photos of actual genitalia. But having said that, we'll be discussing the physiology behind blue balls today. We'll also discuss the physiology behind morning wood, which has to do with REM sleep. Not naughty dreams, any type of active dream. We'll also talk about prostate cancer and who should get screened and maybe who can skip getting screened. I'll also discuss why the testes are external. They'd be a lot safer if they were kept internal. We'll discuss what gets cut in a vasectomy and does this affect anything else besides reproduction. We'll also discuss circumcision and any sort of medical benefits or harm due to this particular type of surgery. And lastly, we'll also discuss the function of Viagra and how it has replaced certain devices such as cock rings and other medical procedures. To do that, I'll start with the spermatic cord. Then we'll talk about the function of the testes. In doing so, we'll have to talk about some hormones in the brain testis axis. And then we'll talk about the function of sperm and then there are a number of accessory glands to discuss that produce the seminal fluids. Let's start with a quick comparison between the male and the female reproductive systems. Over the next couple of lectures, we should see that these two systems contain almost entirely the same organs, which have the same basic functions. There are just some minor detailed differences between the two. Both the male and the female gonads have two major functions. And the first is to produce gametes, or the sex cells. One big difference is that the male gonads produce sperm, and about half a billion of them every day, whereas the female reproductive system produces one egg roughly per month. We'll see later that this is an oversimplification, but I'm going to stick with that for now. The gonads have a second major function, which is to produce hormones. In the case of the testes, those hormones are collectively called androgens. Testosterone is one of those androgens. The female gonads, or the ovaries, also produce hormones in the form of estrogen and progestins. Now let's focus on the male reproductive system. It is composed of both a reproductive tract and a number of accessory organs. The reproductive tract just like the digestive and urinary tracts, is a system of tubes, starting with the seminiferous tubules in the testes, which then connect to the epididymis, then to the vas deferens, to the ejaculatory duct, and then to the urethra. The urethra has three segments, and if you need a little mnemonic to help remember all of these tubes, just remember Steve PMS. The glands, on the other hand, do not contain tubes. These are epithelial in nature and produce both endocrine and exocrine secretions. In addition, the scrotum and the penis help contain some of these tubes and are involved in the function of the reproductive tract. Prior to birth, the testes were located inside the abdominal cavity. They were connected to the vas deferens here, but also to this band of connective tissue called the gubernaculum testis. When the testes begin producing high enough levels of hormones, this will trigger the gubernaculum testis to pull the testes down into the scrotum. The vas deferens and some other structures are drug along behind the testes going for a ride. But as we're going to see, this vas deferens has to loop up and around and over the top of the bladder before going back down into the scrotum to connect to the testes. And this may seem like a fairly circuitous route, but it has to do with where the testes were located initially. The vas deferens is just one part of the spermatic cord, which contains a number of other structures, including testicular arteries and veins, nerves, and lymphatic vessels. In addition, there will be serous membranes and some muscle tissue that I'll talk about in a moment. To connect from the abdominal cavity to each testis, 
all of these tubes must pass through a tiny little tunnel in the abdominal musculature, known as the inguinal canal. In theory, the spermatic cords should fill up this entire canal. All of those tubes, including the blood vessels and vas deferens, are wrapped up in some connective tissue, and there should be no more room within the inguinal canal for other abdominal structures to protrude through. However, it's possible that enough force could be placed on the intestines where they could extrude into the scrotum. There's not much room in the inguinal canal, so whatever portion of the intestines are located in the scrotum will probably not be getting enough blood to survive, and this will lead to ischemia, inflammation, and tissue necrosis. As this tissue dies, it'll release large quantities of inflammatory molecules, which the highly sensitive testicles should pick up on and signal to the brain that that is causing a significant amount of pain. Each testicle is housed within its own separate chamber within the scrotum. There is a septum between the two sides that can be visible from the surface in the form of a raised bump called the raphe. For reasons that are not understood, one testicle hangs a little bit lower than the other. There is a serous membrane that helps to protect each testicle, and this membrane extends through the spermatic cord, and it is an extension of the peritoneum. Down inside the scrotum, however, we call these serous membranes the tunica vaginalis. But just like any serous membrane, there's a visceral and a parietal portion with serous fluid in between that helps to lubricate and cushion each testicle. There are two very important muscles associated with the testes. The first is the dartos muscle, which is a layer of smooth muscle within the dermis of the scrotum. This will cause the scrotum to adopt a more wrinkly appearance when it contracts, or this muscle tissue can relax. In addition, the cremaster muscle is a part of the spermatic cord, and it wraps around the testis. Both of these muscles can help pull the testicles closer to the body wall. If both of these muscles are relaxed, the testes will dangle further away from the abdominal wall, and this helps to lower the temperature within each testicle. This helps to keep the sperm inside the testes refrigerated, if you will. It helps to prolong their lifespan, which, as we're going to see, is going to be important. On the other hand, moving the testes up closer to the abdominal wall raises the temperature in the testes and slows down the production of more sperm. There is a myth that you cannot get pregnant if you have sex in a hot tub, and that's just not true. Each of the testes are already going to have millions of sperm, and it doesn't take that many to lead to fertilization and pregnancy. We're only slowing down sperm production, not killing all of the sperm off. These muscles function to pull the testes closer to the abdominal wall during sexual intercourse. This provides two benefits. One, it keeps them from bouncing around too much. Hence, it can protect them from what many textbooks would describe as vigorous intercourse. It also warms the testes up. When the muscles are relaxed, the testes dangle further away from the body wall, and sperm inside the testes are cooled down and refrigerated. They are kept in a state of more or less suspended animation. But during sex, we're going to need these sperm cells to fertilize an egg, so we warm them up. As we'll see in a bit, the sperm cells are fairly delicate cells. Warming them up too much might cause them damage. It's been theorized that this is what has led humans to prefer having sex in the evening to help keep the sperm at a safer temperature overall. One thing I find interesting is that not all mammals have descended testes. Some have taken the much wiser approach of keeping the testes internal. So there are definitely other ways of regulating sperm activity and function besides keeping them in a cooler external environment. So how do humans protect their testes, if not by keeping them deep inside the abdominal cavity? You know, where females keep their ovaries nice and safe? Well, 
That has to do with the brain and the limbic system. The amygdala does a pretty good job of protecting the testes. Any potential threat to the testes raises a pretty significant alarm within the central nervous system. If you're not sure what I mean, just talk to a man sometime and say the phrases squashed spleen and squashed testicle and see which one seems to elicit a deep subconscious emotional response. Each testicle is surrounded in a very tough layer of connective tissue. We may feel like they're very delicate because they are so highly sensitive, but in truth the testicles are pretty tough little organs thanks to the collagen fibers of the tunica albuginea. This connective tissue extends inside the testis, forming a bunch of separate rooms, the walls of which are called septa. It's within here that we find the functional unit, the seminiferous tubules, which are very long coiled tubes that will ultimately connect to the epididymis and the vas deferens. Initially though, the seminiferous tubules will connect to the reti testis, and then this reti testis would connect to the epididymis, a tubular structure found on the outside of each testicle. The seminiferous tubules, like any tubule, are lined with an epithelium, but between the tubes is a bunch of connective tissue, which contains enough space for blood vessels and nerve fibers and lymphatics, in addition to another very important cell type called the interstitial cells, which are also known as the cells of Leydig. It's these cells that produce androgens, such as testosterone. The formation of sperm involves three major processes. The first is mitosis. Stem cells found out here in the seminiferous tubules will divide to produce two cells, one of which will stay a stem cell and the other of which will enter meiosis. When this one cell enters meiosis, it'll produce four immature gametes. Each of these will have half of the DNA of the stem cell up here. But these are just boring round circular cells. These must then undergo spermiogenesis which will mean growing a long flagellum and a few other things to form these cells here found in the center of the seminiferous tubule, the actual sperm cells or the spermatozoa. Let's review. The stem cells are located in the outer portion of each seminiferous tubule. These will be undergoing mitosis and then some of them will differentiate to enter meiosis which involves two cell divisions, ultimately will produce four immature sperm, each with half of the DNA of the parent cell. And then these must undergo spermiogenesis to form the spermatozoa, which are found in the deepest region, close to the lumen of the seminiferous tubule. There are other cells found within the seminiferous tubules, and these are the nurse cells which you can also call the sustentacular or sertoli cells. And these have a number of very important functions. Their first major function is to maintain the blood testis barrier. Just like the blood brain barrier, this keeps anything found in the blood from entering the lumen of the seminiferous tubules. The nurse cells also support mitosis, meiosis, and spermiogenesis. This is going to be important because as these sperm cells differentiate, they become pretty much crappy at everything else besides fertilizing eggs. The nurse cells will secrete a hormone called inhibin that we'll discuss briefly, and they also make a protein called androgen binding protein, which I'll talk about in more detail when we get to hormone function at the end of the lecture. Let me go back to the blood testis barrier, however. This is maintained by a series of tight junctions between the nurse cells, and this will prevent anything from the blood from entering into the lumen of the seminiferous tubules and vice versa. 
This is important because sperm production doesn't begin until puberty, whereas the immune system, found on the other side of the blood testis barrier, developed before birth. And it was before birth, or maybe shortly after birth, that the immune system was deciding what was self versus non-self. And certainly, any of the proteins found in these flagella would be viewed as non-self by the immune system. If antibodies or white blood cells were able to move across the blood testis barrier, they would destroy these sperm, which could lead to infertility and a bunch of inflammation in a place where men don't really like having a bunch of inflammation. So this blood testis barrier is a pretty important barrier. The nurse cells are stimulated by the hormone FSH, or follicle stimulating hormone. In addition, we require some testosterone, which is going to make things later a little bit confusing. But for now, let's focus on FSH. This will signal to the nurse cells, which will then signal to the stem cells and help them undergo mitosis and meiosis to produce some functional spermatozoa. Those were some of the basic organs of the testes. In addition to the functions of the blood testis barrier, later I'll be talking about the brain testis axis, so don't get that confused with the barrier here. Next, let's talk about sperm. These cells are fairly basic. They have three major parts, a head, which contains the DNA, half of the regular amount of DNA, and a structure called the acrosome, which is going to be very important in the process of fertilization. Then there's the midpiece, which mostly contains mitochondria, which will generate all of the ATP that'll be used by the tail, which is a large flagellum that contains all of the proteins necessary for motility. That means the sperm don't have any endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosomes, or the other half of the DNA that most other cells in the human body have. That makes them fairly simple cells and really only good at a couple things, swimming and fertilizing. They're not so good at taking care of themselves and hence will rely on the rest of the reproductive tract in order for their basic survival. When a cell is done with spermiogenesis, it will detach from the seminiferous tubule to live within the lumen here, it can't do much. It can't swim. It can't really feed itself. So it's going to rely on the rest of the reproductive tract to get it out of the body during ejaculation. From the seminiferous tubules, these sperm cells can be pushed and stored within the epididymis until they are needed. The epididymis is very similar to the testes, only it doesn't produce any sperm cells. It's simply a long coiled tube that can help store these spermatozoa until they're ready, and it can recycle any of them that are no longer needed. The tubes of the epididymis are lined with stereocilia, which is a really bad name because they're not cilia at all. They are microvilli, and they help to increase surface area. That's important because within the epididymis, we need to secrete a lot of nutrients to keep these spermatozoa alive. And when they reach the end of their lifespan, if this man has not ejaculated, these old and worn out sperm cells are going to be recycled. Macrophages can break them down into their core components, and these will be reabsorbed by the epididymis, enter the bloodstream, and can be reused to make new sperm or other things. That means there's no danger to not ejaculating for a long period of time. Sperm cells do wear out if they aren't used, but they are recycled. On the other hand, an ejaculation will cause smooth muscle contractions within the epididymis to propel these sperm up the vas deferens. The vas deferens is a long tube that connects from the epididymis all the way up and over the bladder until it connects to the prostate gland. Like the reproductive and urinary tracts, 
It is lined by two layers of smooth muscle, which can generate peristaltic contractions during ejaculation to help propel these still immobile sperm cells. In addition to peristalsis, cilia line the vas deferens, which help to move the sperm towards the penis. Sperm can stay within the vas deferens for months in a state of suspended animation until they are required. In a surgical procedure known as a vasectomy, both of the vas deferenses are cut and ligated. This will prevent any sperm made in the testes from going any further than the scrotum, and hence there will be no sperm found in semen that is ejaculated. Later, we can discuss what impact this will have on the volume of semen produced. For now, let's focus on the function of the vas deferens, which is a transport tube for sperm. The other major function of the testes is to produce testosterone, but testosterone does not join sperm in the vas deferens and instead is dumped into the bloodstream. And it would be a very terrible surgeon who also cut the blood vessels leading to the testes. Therefore, a vasectomy will have no effect on circulating levels of testosterone. The vas deferens will enter the prostate gland to join up with the urethra. And where these tubes enter the prostate gland, we begin calling that the ejaculatory ducts, one on the right and one on the left. These ejaculatory ducts also connect to a pair of glands known as the seminal vesicles. But then both components, materials from the seminal vesicles and materials from the testes will enter into the urethra within the prostate. As the urethra travels through the prostate, we call it the prostatic urethra. Where it passes through the abdominal wall, we call it the membranous urethra. And then as it travels through the rest of the penis, we call it the spongy or the penile urethra. But now I've mentioned a couple important glands by name, so let's discuss their function in more detail. The paired seminal glands lie on either side of the bladder, and the single prostate gland lies inferior to the bladder, and both of these make fluids that make up the bulk of semen. In addition, the spermatozoa made by the testes are going to be found in this secretion. Later, we'll discuss the function of the bulbo-urethral glands, but for now I'm going to ignore them because they do not make anything found within seminal fluid. Semen contains the spermatozoa, the cells made by the testes. Functionally, these are very important, but they don't take up a lot of space. The vast bulk of semen are the liquids produced by the prostate gland and seminal glands. Within the liquid component of semen are a bunch of molecules that are nutrients, which are important for the survival of these spermatozoa until they can fertilize an egg. The liquid also provides a medium in which the spermatozoa can swim. They would be a lot slower if you asked them to swim on dry land. Lastly, semen contains a number of buffers. This is important because the male urinary tract, the urethra, is probably acidic because urine is frequently acidic. Similarly, the female reproductive tract is also acidic, so we're going to need to buffer those acids to prevent these sperm cells from dying in numbers that are too large to support fertilization. Some of the nutrients found within semen include fructose and other simple carbohydrates. It also includes prostaglandins molecules that we typically associate with inflammation. But in the female reproductive tract, these molecules are going to trigger smooth muscle contractions. Similarly, this helps to stimulate peristaltic contractions within the male reproductive system. Thirdly is the molecule fibrinogen, which when it gets converted into fibrin, causes semen to form a clot, similar to the way that blood forms a clot when tissue becomes injured. Clotted semen helps to keep semen from leaking out of the female reproductive tract after ejaculation. 
The seminal glands produce the bulk of the fluids found within semen, about 60% or so, and this is discharged into the ejaculatory ducts, which then join up with the prostatic urethra. The prostate produces the other roughly one-third of the volume of semen. You'll notice that sperm take up an insignificant amount by volume, despite being very important functionally. And this means that after a vasectomy, there will be no noticeable change to the volume of semen produced during ejaculation. 99.9% .9 of that is produced by the prostate and seminal glands, which are still connected to the reproductive tract. The male reproductive system does not store semen all of the time. Instead, it is produced when required. Sexual arousal will stimulate both the prostate and the seminal glands to start producing fluids. We could go into a fairly lengthy discussion let me just say that there are a number of reasons, both biological and otherwise, why it would not be beneficial to have men capable of ejaculation at the moment of sexual arousal. It's going to take some time in between the first moment of sexual arousal until a man can ejaculate. And that time is the time it takes the seminal glands and the prostate to produce enough of the fluid components to produce enough semen required for ejaculation. If ejaculation does not occur, these fluids can build up within the prostate, causing pressure within this gland. The prostate has a number of nerve endings, but there can also be a little bit of radiated pain that might be felt within the testes, because the testes have a high number of nerve endings as well, that is commonly referred to as blue balls. This is simply referred pain, and it's not harmful. These fluids can be reabsorbed by the reproductive tract if they are not ejaculated. Therefore, there is absolutely no reason for a man to try and pressure somebody into sex for any fear to his reproductive tract. Blue balls is definitely a physiological phenomenon, and it can be very uncomfortable for a while, there's more than one way to ejaculate besides intercourse, but even if ejaculation doesn't occur, these fluids will definitely be reabsorbed and not cause any damage to the reproductive tract in the meantime. The prostate gland, like all glands, is made of epithelial cells. And if these cells divide too quickly and produce too many of themselves, this can lead to a condition called benign prostatic hyperplasia. This simply means that the prostate is a little bit too big. And because the urethra travels through the middle of the prostate, this can compress the urethra, making urination difficult. Surgery can alleviate this blockage to the urethra by an overgrown prostate gland. On the other hand, Similar symptoms can be seen with prostate cancer. This is definitely uncontrolled growth of the prostate gland. Both of these can cause difficulty with urination. Determining which is cancerous and which is not can be tricky. One very common test for whether there is cancer of the prostate or not is a blood test looking for a protein called prostate-specific antigen. We don't really care about the function of this protein, just that the only gland that makes it in the male reproductive system is the prostate gland. Therefore, if you have an abnormally large prostate gland, thanks to a tumor, there is frequently way too much of this protein found within the bloodstream. It's not the most accurate of tests, therefore a follow-up biopsy is almost always undertaken. But again, trying to distinguish between these two symptoms can be difficult because of the similarity in their symptoms, the difficulty with urination. Currently, the blood PSA test is still one of the more common early screenings for cancer in men. And yet there's a significant amount of controversy over whether men should be getting this test at all. In fact, both of these government groups 
are no longer recommending the blood PSA test at all. And the American Cancer Society, another very big group, is a little less sure of their stance. So why do some groups no longer recommend this test? Well, it's based off of this data here, which showed that for every thousand men getting a PSA test, and these are just men of a certain age. There's no reason to think that they're going to get prostate cancer other than the fact that they're men and they're over the age of 55. Out of all of these men, many of them are going to show negatives for this test and that test is correct. They don't have prostate cancer. But a large number of them are going to show up with false positives and they're going to get a biopsy which is going to show that they don't actually have prostate cancer. But a false positive is going to come with a little bit of stress. These men might worry for a while that they have cancer. Some of these men are going to get positives back and then undergo surgery. And out of those surgeries, uh, roughly four or five of these men are going to wind up dying from prostate cancer anyway. But this guy over here is going to have his life saved. So one out of a thousand men are going to have their lives saved. And that's not an insignificant number. Hey, we'd like to have a better percentage, but that's a lot of men. So why don't we just do this? And it's because of this group here in blue, the men whose lives aren't saved. They may have had prostate cancer. They underwent surgery, but it turns out that their surgery doesn't extend their life at all. They could have gone without surgery and lived just as long. But having undergone prostate cancer surgery and possibly chemotherapy afterwards, they develop complications like incontinence. And this reduces their quality of life and the stress involved with this unnecessary surgery and the stress of just knowing that you have cancer seems to equal the benefit that this one guy got here. His life is extended for just as long as these guys' lives are reduced. And so we see no net benefit to society as a whole if every man goes in for prostate cancer screening at the age of 55. So why do so many men get this cancer screening done? Well, it's often free. So who's paying for it? Well, the folks who manufacture adult undergarments are one of the big donors when it comes to paying for free PSA screenings. And they know very well that if they pay for a thousand PSA tests, that a certain number of these men are going to develop complications that will require them to purchase an adult undergarment. Not just once, but for the rest of their lives. And it winds up being profitable. So it was based off of this data here that these two groups stopped recommending the PSA test for healthy men. Now that's not to say nobody should get this test. If you're at a higher risk for prostate cancer, maybe, be, maybe because it runs in your family, then yes, you should absolutely talk to your doctor. And that's possibly why the American Cancer Society, at this point in time, seems to be trying to stand on the fence. But this just illustrates how cancer screening can be a tricky wicket. And we're not done with this topic. I want to talk about it a little bit more when we talk about cervical cancer screening and breast cancer screening. I'd like to compare those two to these tests here because there's some controversy about breast cancer screening as well that I'll get to in the next lecture. Okay, back to anatomy and physiology. I told you I would discuss the bulbourethral glands which are also called the Cowper's glands. They are to the left and the right side of the membranous urethra, which is why you can't see them on this model because this is a mid-sagittal section. These are tiny little secretory glands that produce alkaline mucus prior to ejaculation. So we call this secretion pre-ejaculate. And assuming that the man had not just ejaculated previously, 
this mucus does not contain any cells that could lead to fertilization of an egg. This mucus serves to neutralize acids found in the urethra and also to provide a little bit of lubrication to the glands during intercourse. And again, it's not the same as semen, although it's possible in the case of a multiple ejaculation that there had been some sperm left over in the penile urethra that could have been pushed out by a second secretion by these bulbo glands, but that's probably a fairly rare occurrence. Okay, so those were the three major glands in the male reproductive tract. I had two of them that produced the fluids found within semen. Those were the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland, which made up the vast majority of the volume of semen. In addition to that, we found the sperm produced by the testes. And while they didn't take up a lot of space, functionally, they were, of course, very important. We also discussed the bulbo-urethral glands, which produced the alkaline mucus that was pre-ejaculate. Next, we're going to move on to the penis. So just a heads up, I am going to be showing a picture from the finest resources of Wikimedia Commons. And I say this to my students in my face-to-face -face class, no, don't worry, you have not just been shown a picture of your teacher's penis. I don't think I would be working for much longer had I actually done that. The penis is a tubular organ uh, through which the last portion of the urethra passes, and it introduces semen to the female vagina. When it comes to sex, you're going to have to find that biologists have to come up with all sorts of funky ways to say things that don't sound too puerile. So I love this phrase here. It gets used a lot in anatomy textbooks. It introduces semen, as if to say, semen, have you met vagina? Vagina, semen. Semen, vagina, I'm so glad you two are going to get along just swell. And before I move on, I also want to point out that anatomy textbooks have to discuss sex as if the only function of sex was reproduction. And furthermore, that the only type of sex is heterosexual vaginal sex. And I'm going to keep with that because, you know, I'm posting these videos on YouTube and people could be using these against me in the future if they so wanted to. So let's just keep pretending that the only reason to have a penis is to introduce sperm cells to the female vagina to fertilize eggs and produce babies. Sure. And I know that's rather unfortunate because many of you want to make your patients healthier and happier. And a healthy sex life is an important part of anybody's overall health. And that is not limited to heterosexual sex for the purposes of reproduction. Nevertheless, I'm getting paid to teach you anatomy and physiology, not a human sexuality course, and so let's get back to the anatomy of the penis. What we can see here is the external portion of the penis, which includes the shaft, highlighted here by the bracket, and the most distal portion, the glands. You'll notice there's no letter D in this word. It is not a gland. It is the glands. What we can't see is the root of the penis, which are the internal portions of the penis that extend inside the abdominal wall, but are still a continuation of the erectile tissue found in the body and the shaft, excuse me, the body and the glands of the penis. The glands of the penis can be partially or fully covered by the prepuce or the foreskin. It's within here that we find glands with the letter D. Prepucial glands can produce a waxy material known as smegma. And it's within this material that bacteria can grow leading to infections. And circumcision of the foreskin or the epithelial and connective tissue that surrounds the glands can help prevent these infections. So is this an important medical procedure? The removal of this extra skin? 
Well, when this surgery is performed, the glands cornifies, meaning it begins producing keratin, which makes it a little bit harder. And this may or may not remove the dendrites of a whole bunch of fine touch receptors. So we worry that circumcision may reduce the sensitivity of the glands. Of course, if you're having sex with somebody who's circumcised, if their glands is less sensitive, that might just mean it takes longer for them to ejaculate following the time of initial sexual arousal. And that means for a longer time having sex, and maybe not everybody would agree with me that that's a bad thing. Still, let's focus on the medicine. Does this actually reduce the sensitivity of the glands? Well, there's no scientific evidence to suggest that it does or that it doesn't. And that's based off of studying whether men who are circumcised or not report premature ejaculation. And there's no difference between these two groups. So medically speaking, I think we can say there's no reason not to circumcise a child. On the other hand, are there any benefits to circumcision? Well, it does reduce infections of the glands. However, with proper hygiene, there's no need for circumcision. As long as you have access to clean water and with a proper regimen, keeping the glands free of infection is fairly simple. So let me summarize then. Is there any medical reason for male circumcision or any medical reason to avoid male circumcision? If your patients are asking you this, I think you can tell them that medicine really has no reason to say yes or no, at least not here in the United States. In places where clean water isn't as prevalent, this is a different question. But for here, from where I'm talking, I think you can reassure your patients that any decision they make for their newborn son is going to be perfectly fine, medically speaking. And they can go with whatever is consistent with their family history. Please note, I said male circumcision. Female circumcision should never occur under any circumstances. And there are definitely medical reasons to not do that. But we'll talk about that in the next portion of the chapter. For now, if parents do opt for circumcision for their male children, that foreskin can have uses later. If it is saved, it can be maintained and grown within petri dishes and then used later in a tissue graft. Right now, this is only used in grafts to help skin heal for diabetic complications like this ulcer that we see here. The fibroblasts and the keratinocytes that would be found in the foreskin the keratinocytes, of course, coming from the epidermis and the fibroblasts from the dermis are going to maintain a temporary seal on this rather large ulcer, but they're only going to survive for about four weeks afterwards. And by that time, the patient's own skin cells would ha have had the chance to migrate into this tissue and replace the donor cells. What might be left is the collagen scaffold that you have added to this wound that helps to speed up injury repair. This scaffold provides a framework for the patient's own cells to grow into this area and fix the damage. It also blocks infections. Typically, we would be using some sort of gauze to block infections and gauze cannot produce a scaffold to help this patient's own stem cells migrate into the area and fix the damage. Hence, this foreskin reuse, uh, this tissue graft, has been shown to speed up tissue repair in ulcers caused by diabetic complications. Perhaps in the future, it'll be used for other types of skin grafts, but I don't know. Moving on, this is not a cartoon of Cartman from South Park. Uh, this is a cross-section through the penis. 
And what we are seeing here is that there are three major structures found within the penis comprised of erectile tissue. There are two large capora cavernosa shown here. At the center of each of these capora cavernosa is an artery that can provide blood supply to this erectile tissue. Here's another view showing the paired capora cavernosa. In addition to those two, there's also a singular corpus spongiosum, which surrounds the urethra. Both the capora cavernosa and the capora spongiosa are composed of erectile tissue. Hey, remember back in BI-231 when we learned about all of the major tissue types? We didn't talk about erectile tissue back then, nor did we talk about scar tissue. It's okay, I don't really remember that far back either, but your patients may have heard of scar tissue and erectile tissue. In fact, they may even talk about these tissues from time to time with you. On the other hand, they'll have never heard about any of the others that we learned about, like simple columnar epithelial tissue or dense irregular connective tissue. And to me, that seems kind of weird. So what is erectile tissue? Well, it's connective tissue and smooth muscle tissue, which can regulate the flow of blood into this tissue and then provide the ability for this tissue to expand up to a point causing pressure. In a resting state, the amount of blood that enters this tissue is going to be equal to the amount of blood that leaves this tissue, just enough to keep it alive. But if we block the exit of blood out of this tissue and keep allowing blood into this tissue, it will cause the tissue to swell and expand. Hence the phrase erectile. Oh no, wait, I haven't explained erectile yet. Blood can flow into a lot of tissues, causing them to swell and get larger. This happens to some of my skeletal muscles, especially when I'm exercising, they feel like they're a bit larger because they're full of more fluid, but they're not exactly erect, are they? No, there's a very big difference between blood flowing into a tissue causing it to swell and blood flowing into a tissue causing it to become erect. And there's a very good little TED talk down here if you want to know a little bit more about it. But one of the big differences here between erectile tissue and most other tissues is the arrangement of collagen fibers. These are strong fibers that don't stretch. If you put pressure onto this tissue, it will get bigger up until a certain point, and then the erectile tissue can't get any larger. But if more blood flows into this tissue, it will increase pressure in this tissue, causing it to gain the ability to stand erect without any muscular or skeletal support. It's very different from what a water balloon does. If you fill up a water balloon with more and more and more water, it simply gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It doesn't suddenly stand upright or erect on its own. That requires these collagen fibers here and hydrostatic pressure something that we see in a lot of aquatic species, but we typically don't use it so much up on dry land for mobility. We usually rely on bones and muscles for that. The one place that we still rely on hydrostatic pressure, at least for us humans, is for the erections that we see in the penis and uh, later the clitoris as well. So increased blood flows into this erectile tissue following sexual arousal. What's important is that when that causes swelling of the erectile tissue, that will put pressure on the drainage vein here, which pushes it shut. Therefore, blood flows in, but it's not flowing out, and this leads to erection. For people who had problems maintaining an erection, it was helpful 
to put pressure on this drainage vein mechanically, either with a hand or with a band of metal. But these days, that is more commonly done with a drug called Viagra. This is a vasodilator that causes huge amounts of blood to flow in through these arteries here, which causes a massive amount of swelling, which helps to compress the drainage veins. The signal that triggers vasodilation. Uh, this is our common pattern of, in pharmacology. We block a blocker. This sort of double negative means that Viagra does not cause erections. Somebody must still become sexually aroused. It will then strengthen the erection following that. This is important because prolonged erections can be dangerous. Normally, an erection will subside when sexual arousal subsides. There are many drugs that can trigger erections in the absence of sexual arousal. And this condition is called priapism or a prolonged erection. And the problem with that is if you get a bunch of blood flowing into the penis, but then it doesn't flow back out, you're not getting fresh blood supply to the penis. And after a few hours, that could cause cell death in the penis leading to necrosis. And that's not a place that many men would really like to have a bunch of necrosis. Okay, back to erections though. The increase in blood flow to the penis is triggered by parasympathetic stimulation. The release of nitric oxide by the parasympathetic nervous system triggers vasodilation of these arteries which can lead to erection. This is typically a result of sexual arousal, but there are other things that will trigger parasympathetic nerve fibers in the pudendal nerve. For instance, a full bladder triggers a reflex involving these parasympathetic nerve fibers of the pudendal nerve. We talked about this a couple of chapters ago. And one of the bleed through effects, if you will, is that a full bladder can also trigger an erection. There's no real function to this. It's just a little bit of overlap between parasympathetic stimulation of the bladder and the penis. Ooh, and I almost forgot, REM sleep also increases parasympathetic tone. Therefore, anytime a man is dreaming, that can also lead to an erection. And we typically wake shortly after a REM cycle. And therefore, if a man wakes up with an erection, that is not a sign that he was just having some sort of sexy dream that led to sexual arousal. That's just a sign that he was in REM sleep. Hence, we have a phrase for that known as morning wood. So, that's a quick overview of the erectile tissues of the penis, including the paired corpora cavernosa and the corpora spongiosa, which helps to keep the urethra open during an erection. Otherwise, the corpora cavernosa might also squeeze this tube shut the way that it squeezes that large drainage vein shut. The last part of this lecture is to cover the hormones involved in the male reproductive system. And because hormones aren't very interesting, this should only take about 30 seconds. Oh, wait, I was being sarcastic. So we need to cover the brain testis axis. The brain, uh, mainly the hypothalamus, is going to produce the hormone GnRH at a fairly constant level. This will trigger the pituitary to make two hormones, LH and FSH, which have two basic functions. LH activates the interstitial cells to produce testosterone, while as FSH triggers the nurse cells to aid in spermiogenesis, or the production of sperm. Because testosterone was also required for spermiogenesis, this can be a little bit confusing if you're trying to be completely accurate. But let's simplify here. LH triggers testosterone production. FSH triggers sperm production. 
from the two most important cells found here in the testes, the Leydig cells and the nurse cells, which assist the stem cells in producing sperm. And then, like any good endocrine system, we've got a negative feedback loop, both testosterone produced by the Leydig cells, as well as inhibin produced by the nurse cells, can travel through the bloodstream to block excessive production of GnRH from the hypothalamus. Okay, let's start with testosterone. It's produced in the testes by those interstitial cells, and it has a very important function in the testes, which is to help with the process of spermatogenesis. But if that's all that it had to do, we really wouldn't need a hormone. And hormones are dumped into the bloodstream. So some of this testosterone is going to travel to other parts of the body to have other very important functions. It travels all the way back to the brain, where it not only blocks the production of GnRH, it also stimulates brain regions involved in sex drive or libido. This is true for both men and women. Ooh, gosh. So where are women getting their testosterone considering they don't have testes? Well, that'll be a question for the next chapter. For now, men are producing testosterone and it helps to drive libido. It also activates cells all throughout the body and generally increases their metabolic rate, especially involved in protein synthesis for both bone and muscle tissue and also blood cell formation. That's why men typically have a higher hematocrit than women and also typically have higher muscle mass than women. And I say typically because, of course, we all exist on a very broad spectrum. Not every man has more muscle tissue and more red blood cells than every woman. But in general, if you were to average it out, then yes, men have more red blood cells and more muscle tissue and higher bone density. This is very important in medicine when treating diseases like osteoporosis. We must consider that more women are going to get that disease than men because more men have higher levels of testosterone, whereas women lose their estrogen production during menopause. Oh, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. We're focusing on testosterone. Another very important function of testosterone is to block triglyceride uptake by adipose tissue and visceral fat. Therefore, higher levels of testosterone should mean lower levels of visceral fat. So what can generate more testosterone? Well, fully functioning testes, as well as active muscle tissue. We talked about that in BI-231. Nevertheless, what we're worrying about here is that low levels of testosterone, or of this molecule here, which I haven't talked about, could lead to problems with the amount of fat in a person's body and in fact their overall metabolic rate which can contribute to type 2 diabetes and there's a big market for selling testosterone supplements to men with the idea that they should be doing this for their health when in reality they might be getting other benefits one of the best ways to sell those testosterone supplements is to do a blood testosterone test and tell that patient they don't have enough testosterone and they need to supplement to be healthier. And unfortunately, it's not that simple. I mean, when is the endocrine system ever that simple? Now, for the sex steroids, it's even less simple than anything we've really discussed before. And that's because most of the testosterone, which is produced here in the testes predominantly, stays in the testes. And that's because of a protein made by the nurse cells called androgen binding protein. That keeps most of the testosterone right here in the testes where it can stimulate spermiogenesis. Only a small amount of testosterone produced in the testes 
leaves the testes. And that's because of two important factors. The first is SHBG, the protein in the testes that holds testosterone in the testes. And the second is that testosterone is a lipid. It's a steroid hormone produced from cholesterol and being a lipid, it does not dissolve freely in the bloodstream to a very high amount. Only about 2% of the testosterone that we produce can simply dissolve in blood plasma. The rest must get help from one of these two proteins. Either albumin, which we've already learned about last quarter, or this new protein called SHBG, which is steroid hormone binding globulin. And it's a protein that can help bind to testosterone and transport it through the blood to reach its distant targets. Before it can have full activity on its targets, it must first be converted into dihydrotestosterone. This is simply testosterone with two more hydrogens. Both of these molecules are considered androgens, but now it could bind to its receptor. Because it's a steroid hormone, it can easily diffuse across the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Hence, its receptor proteins are found floating in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. And when the androgen receptors bind to dihydrotestosterone, they will dimerize, enter the nucleus if necessary, bind to DNA, and increase the transcription of testosterone responsive genes. So what sorts of genes might get turned on by testosterone or DHT? Well, in muscle cells, that would be actin and myosin and a number of others, leading to muscle hypertrophy. In bone tissue, this will lead to the increase in bone density. In adipose tissue, it'll increase the metabolism of triglycerides. And in the skin, this could lead to the growth of hair follicles in a number of places. Hey, many of my friends who are bald like to remind me that they have really high levels of testosterone in their skin. Hence, uh, therefore, bald men are more manly. I like to remind them that the reason that they are bald is because it's dihydrotestosterone that drives hair follicle growth. And the reason that they have high levels of testosterone is because they're not converting that molecule into DHT, which is leading to their male pattern baldness. And that's why I don't have many friends. Anyhow, let's move on. Okay, so I alluded to earlier that a serum testosterone test might be used for quackery rather than medicine. So why is this not a very useful test? Well, okay, it's a useful test, but it's just one metric, but we should definitely not rely on this one metric. And the reason we shouldn't rely on just this metric is that testosterone levels are tightly regulated by a complex negative feedback loop, and we should consider all elements of this negative feedback loop. So how much testosterone is produced? Well, that's under the control of the hypothalamus. And how much of this hormone here, GnRH, is being produced? And GnRH will, in turn, trigger the pituitary to produce LH, which triggers the interstitial cells to produce testosterone. Okay, fine. So far, that's fairly simple. But... Uh, we don't really care about testosterone produced by the interstitial cells uh, because really we need to convert that testosterone into dihydrotestosterone to really activate the androgen receptors. Therefore, if somebody can't convert testosterone into DHT, that might lead to a reduction in the negative feedback loop that's blocking GnRH production. That's okay. If they aren't producing that much DHT, that just means they'll keep producing GnRH until testosterone levels are so high that they get enough dihydrotestosterone to finally trigger a negative feedback loop. 
Okay, so we should be worried about DHT levels. Ooh, but uh, much of that is going to stay in the testes, thanks to androgen binding protein. And that's not something that we're going to be biopsying. You're not going to find many guys willing to get a needle injected into their testes just so that they can get a legal supply of anabolic steroids. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. So much of the testosterone produced in the testes stays in the testes, and we're really going to have no idea how much that is. A small amount will leave the bloodstream. And that will be dependent on the amount of SHBG and albumin found in the bloodstream. Albumin levels are fairly constant as far as I know, but SHBG levels can be altered. The more SHBG in the bloodstream, the more active testosterone we could get in the bloodstream. And that's what's ultimately going to lead to a reduction in GnRH block this testosterone from entering the blood, you will block this negative feedback loop, which is going to mean more GnRH is produced until finally you get enough testosterone in the blood to trigger inhibition of GnRH production. Okay, so that's two levels of complexity. We've got a third level of complexity. It's not just how much dihydrotestosterone is produced or enters the blood. We also have to worry about how responsive to that hormone the rest of the body is. Different men have slightly different versions of the androgen receptor, the same way that different men have slightly different versions of hair color and skin color. We exist on a spectrum. Different men are going to be more sensitive to testosterone or less sensitive to testosterone. For the men who are less sensitive to testosterone, it's going to take higher levels of testosterone in the blood to trigger the effects of testosterone, like increased muscle mass, increased bone density, and increased uh, inhibition of GnRH production. I know I said that kind of backwards, but I'm far too long in this slide to go back and say it properly. Let me rephrase that though. If you're highly sensitive to testosterone, then it's going to take less testosterone in your bloodstream to block testosterone production. But if you're a man who's not very sensitive to testosterone, because your antigen receptors aren't that good, it's going to take much higher levels of testosterone to be produced before your brain stops producing less GnRH. And if all of that seemed a bit confusing, it's because it should. Hormones are confusing, and the reproductive hormones are extra confusing. That's what keeps people like me in business. So let me try and simplify things here for you a little bit, just to make up for that extra amount of confusion on the previous slide. We've got two hormones made by the pituitary. There's follicle stimulating hormone or FSH. The major function of this hormone is to stimulate the nurse cells to undergo spermatogenesis. And of course, it's not the nurse cells undergoing spermatogenesis. They drive the stem cells to undergo mitosis, meiosis, and spermiogenesis. But they're driving the whole process. On the other hand, we also have luteinizing hormone, which also comes from the pituitary. And that one stimulates the interstitial cells to produce testosterone. The reason that this can become confusing is because testosterone is also necessary for spermatogenesis. Still, let's keep things simple. FSH drives sperm production. LH drives testosterone production. And of course, testosterone does a lot of stuff. One of the things that testosterone does is get converted into estrogen. Yes, this is happening in men. A small amount of circulating testosterone is converted into estradiol, which is a form of estrogen. 
this requires certain enzymes, but here, here we have a pathway. We start with cholesterol, and ultimately we can form a few intermediates that you may have heard of, like androstenedione or DHEA. This ultimately can get converted into testosterone, which can then be converted into estrogen. Uh, the ovaries are going to be doing a lot of this in the next chapter, but this can also be happening in men, especially up in the central nervous system. Some of that testosterone will be converted into estrogen by an enzyme known as an aromatase. And my last slide here for the day is just to show you these steroid hormones. All of them are based on cholesterol, but here's testosterone. And over here is estrogen and progesterone. We've only got, you know, a few differences on some hydrogens and, and whatnot over here. Uh, but it, there's not a huge difference between these hormones. It's enough that this guy will bind to an androgen receptor. Uh, this gal over here will bind to an estrogen receptor. And this gal over here to a progesterone receptor. But still, the interconversion of these molecules are very simple chemical reactions. And that's going to be fairly important when we come to development of the central nervous system. So I wanted to introduce this concept here before we move on. But that's going to wrap us up for the male reproductive system. It's going to take a little bit longer to get through the female reproductive system, but uh, maybe you didn't need to come to this class to learn that women are complicated. I, of course, say that with tongue-in-cheek. It's all in good fun. Uh, but this wraps us up for this chapter, and I'll see you in the next chapter. We're almost done for the year.